seen him make changes, including eliminating overtime for postal service workers, removing mail sorting machines, uh, removing senior leadership, including two top leaders and over two dozen leaders who handle day-to-day -day operations. And he claims that these changes are needed for financial stability, but he's undertaken these changes in literally the final weeks of a major presidential election cycle. Um, we're going to take some time kind of walking through the impact of these changes and talk about the actions that we can collectively take to uh, beat back the current crisis. I want to turn the floor over first to you, Michael. Um, you know, the president just a moment ago issued a tweet talking about drop boxes being incredibly problematic. And no doubt the crisis has been one cast in starkly partisan terms. Talk to me a, a little bit about um, how you view this issue in terms of how Democrats and Republicans view vote by mail? Well, to be honest and frank about it, um, Republicans and Democrats have viewed vote by mail the exact same way. They Both parties have engaged over the last 25 or 30 years uh, actively in this space. In fact, Republicans um, have uh, used uh, this form of voting um, in a wide range of elections, uh, both up and down the ballot uh, for a number of years. In fact, a lot of strategies have kind of built around that get out the vote effort, uh, doing the vote by mail uh, piece. So this, re this, this narrative that has been put out here by uh, Trump and his uh, ilk uh, have uh, basically uh, put this in a very political context. Um, of all the things that the parties have gone back and forth over in the voting space, it has never been a battle over vote by mail. Uh, we all, because we know the impact and the importance of it for our overseas ballots, uh, for those individuals, expats who live still live overseas but still vote here in the United States, certainly our military, uh, again, uh, take great advantage of the postal system and the ability to, uh, while they're stationed in foreign lands, uh, to still participate in, in our uh, democracy here at home. So this is all part of a broader political narrative to sort of create this straw dog argument around the, the badness of, of vote by mail. Uh, the president himself saying a couple of weeks ago, well, you know, I, I like the idea of that, you know, you can go out and uh, access the ballot, you know, uh, absentee ballot, uh, but that vote by mail is a bad thing. Well, as I said then, and we'll say again, if everybody understand, they're the same thing. Absentee ballot, vote by mail, same process, same result. You get a ballot, just vote, put it in the mail, send it back. So I think we need to understand and contextualize um, that this is all a political gamble by the president uh, to, I have to say with reluctance, some degree of success so far in sort of creating this negative narrative around something that both parties have engaged in legitimately with very, very, very few instances of fraud uh, that rose to the level where the federal government or state agencies would take action um, and to put us on a poor footing going into this November election. Amber. Um, your organization is on the front lines helping many states figure out how they can handle the growing volume of people who are seeking to uh, cast votes by mail in their states. Talk to me uh, about kind of what we saw this weekend, which is an enraged public that's feeling very anxious and wondering kind of what we should be doing now and, and people are kind of saying, you know what, maybe we need to figure this out on our, on our own. If the Postal Service can't get the ballots uh, there on time, then maybe we should start kind of creating systems and ways of collecting ballots uh, in our communities. Talk, talk to me about uh, kind of what, what you're seeing in, in states around the country right now. Sure. Well, and thanks for having me, Kristen. And it's great to be here with this amazing panel. Um, I So first and foremost, what I would say is uh, just kind of in response to the latest tweet um, about Dropboxes is Dropbox managed and run by election officials has been a staple 
principle actually of election security in various states. In fact, when I was uh, director of elections in Denver, this was actually one of the prime uh, pillars of the reform that we wrote into our laws seven years ago now, um, expanding drop boxes at libraries, rec centers, government facilities. We even have in Denver, there's various drop boxes at RTD and bus line and trace train line uh, locations. Um, and the whole idea really is to meet people where they are in their everyday lives. And that what's interesting about that concept is that's exactly what the Postal Service does, is they're meeting people every day where they are. And the Postal Service is the only entity, the only government or business or private that serves every single household, every single citizen, along with every election office. There's actually not another entity that has the infrastructure in place to do that daily. And so the, the post office has frankly been beyond absentee ballots. It's been a critical tenet of the election process generally. And I've been pointing this out. You know, there's a lot of uh, focus on mail-in ballots, but I think we're, we're also losing sight of what else goes through the post office in addition to all of the other things outside of the election process, voter registration confirmations, poll worker notices to confirm people's election judge status, polling place notifications to tell voters where their in-person voting locations are, ballot issue notices, legally required tax issue notices in various states. Like these are all legally required mailings and it's actually a much higher volume than even mail ballots. Um, and so the election system generally has relied on the post office primarily because the postal service is just like elections. It's providing a, a critical service to the electorate at large. And it is, and, and it, and it's the only entity that's actually capable of doing that. And the postal service, I mean, I've worked with the postal service for 15 years as an election official and then uh, now as running a nonprofit. And they are um, incredibly committed to their role in, in, in the election process, but also just delivering Americans on a daily basis what they need. And so, you know, the attacks, I, I think that a lot of it, to be honest, is a lack of understanding of the process. That's how I see it. I know back in 2016, I had invited the president and his campaign, along with all the other candidates and campaigns that we always do, to come see the process in Denver when some of these similar type of some of the similar type of language was used at rallies and things like that. And the fact is, I think there's a lack of understanding on, on the administration's part in terms of how this works, how it is more secure, how it is managed correctly. Um, and, and, and I think we have to get, we have to figure out a way to kind of, you know, go, go get through the noise and actually communicate to the public uh, what the real process is, because what's being communicated right now on Twitter and sort of through the airways to me shows a complete lack of understanding of the election process on, beh on behalf of some of the uh, folks that have been sort of saying and, and spewing all of this misinformation. Um, but then I think secondly, you know, election security, resiliency, all of these things is really, really important in terms of our process. And what we also have to make sure is that the election process is secure. So I also, you know, over the weekend, there were some suggestions that community org organizations or groups should set up their own drop boxes. Well, that's also highly problematic. And I, I talked with election officials over the weekend in various states that have used drop boxes for a long period of time very concerned about this idea that third party groups, not election officials would be, you know, trying to set something up like that, because that could seriously confuse voters and introduce a whole new level of, of security issues into the process that we also don't want to see. So there's a balance here between access, the right information, doing it well. And what we're really focused on, my organization at the National Vote at Home Institute, is helping election officials get it right. So you know, putting out more drop boxes, offering drive up, drop off with manned election judges, manning those sorts of uh, services, but, but putting it out through the official election channels, because that's critical in, in meeting voters where they are and also securing the election process so that we can fend off bad information out in the, in the domain about this. Yeah, and we'll, we'll come back to this because I know that um, some of the mobilization we saw over the weekend comes from a good place. People who see the crisis and don't want to risk waiting until the last minute to figure out whether the Postal Service can get its act together. So we'll come back to talking about constructive, helpful actions that the public can take 
right now. But Walter, I want to go to you next. Um, everybody's been talking about Louis DeJoy's background. He is not somebody who comes to the role with any experience having worked inside the Postal Service. Um, he is a, a Trump mega donor. He donated himself $1.2 million to President Trump. He donated, donated $1.3 million to the RNC. He currently holds about 30 to $75 million in investments in corporations that are deemed competitors to the Postal Service. Um, I know that um, in your role as the former head of the U.S. Government of Ethics, that these are ki the kinds of issues um, that you look at in figuring out whether you've got somebody who can really occupy central roles inside the government with integrity. So tell me your thoughts about DeJoy. And we also understand that the Inspector General is now uh, looking at the situation. So curious as to whether you have confidence in where the Inspector General's investigation might take us. Sure. So part of the problem with Louis DeJoy's conflicts of interest is the product of a vulnerability in our ethics program. Uh, the Office of Government Ethics gets involved in reviewing the financial disclosure reports of nominees for Senate-confirmed presidential appointments and works with them to craft ethics agreements to resolve their conflicts of interest if they're confirmed for the position. The problem is the Postal Service um, is headed by a Postmaster General who is not Senate-confirmed, and as a result, the, his financial disclosure report never went to the Office of Government Ethics. Instead, it was reviewed in-house by ethics officials who were reporting to him. He was the boss of the individuals reviewing um, their report, and around the time they were reviewing it was when Alexander Vindman was driven out of government because he testified against the president in the impeachment hearings. And so I don't have a high degree of confidence that his financial disclosure form received the level of attention it should have. The Postal Service has refused to answer questions or concerns by releasing a copy of any kind of financial disclosure report or recusal statement that he has signed. Uh, my organization, CREW, Citizens for Responsibility and Ethics in Washington, is pursuing that against the Postal Service and may have to sue if they don't turn it over under the Freedom of Information Act. But these processes are not quick. And the Postal Service could put to rest some concerns by talking about how it conducted its review. In response to inquiries from some reporters, they said you don't have to worry about his holdings, including around $30 million in one Postal Service contractor or vendor called XPO Logistics, which is a supply chain manager. In other words, the people who are gonna actually make sure things go where they're supposed to be going uh, because he doesn't get involved in the contracts. The problem is the conflict of interest law that he's subject to, which is a criminal law, covers more than just narrow party matters involving contracts or litigation. It also involves something called particular matters of general applicability. And I won't bore you with the legal analysis of what that means, but it's broader than just a contract. If he's taking actions that affect postal service contractors as a class or uh, supply chain distributors as a class, he could be committing a crime if those changes affect the companies in which he holds. The irony is that his wife has been nominated for a position as ambassador, and the State Department Ethics Office usually pushes back really hard when the Office of Government Ethics demands divestitures. In this case, however, her own ethics agreement says that if she's confirmed, she'll voluntarily divest her interests in this exact company, which means he'll have to sell it. So we have a situation where he's already said he can get rid of it, and yet he's chosen not to. It's almost as if they're holding the Postal Service hostage and saying, unless you confirm my wife as an ambassador, I'm gonna hold on to this conflict of interest. Then he did one other really strange thing. On June 24th, he sold his shares of stock in Amazon, which makes sense because Amazon could be a huge conflict of an interest in an administration where President Trump 
pressured DeJoy's predecessor to retaliate against Amazon because Amazon's CEO, Jeff Bezos, also owns the Washington Post and President Trump doesn't like the free press. Um, so DeJoy divested this Amazon stock and then immediately bought stock options over the over the counter over the counter stock options, not employment related stock options in Amazon, which means he continues to hold a financial interest in it. And his stock option interest is very strange because a stock option is a contractual right to buy stock at a certain price. Well, the price they're giving him the right to purchase it at was already below uh, the fair market value of that stock, uh, and he had to pay a premium to get it. So there are some real questions Congress should be asking if he shows up for the hearing next week about how in the world um, he, you know, what is he up to with this strange stock option, and how in the world is he managing recusals if he holds massive millions of dollars of holdings in, in companies affected by or competing with the Postal Service while purportedly running the Postal Service. In terms of the Inspector General, I have confidence that the Inspector General will do a good job. The problem is that Inspector General investigations aspire to be done within a year. And in reality, it can take a year and a half or two years to completion. And that'll be much too late to help us with this particular election. Uh, they can issue what's called a management alert where they issue preliminary findings and release them publicly or to the agency head uh, if they come across a situation that needs immediate amelioration, such as um, the, the postmaster general sabotaging the supply process, the, the uh, delivery processes. So hopefully they'll do that. But sometimes inspectors general are scared of looking political, and so I don't know if they'll be willing to do that. So I, I'm not entirely confident that a solution is going to come from within the government. Yeah. So um, the postmaster general got there uh, after being named by Trump and um, serves at the pleasure of the Board of Governors, which uh, currently has six members, no diversity, all white men. Um, Joyce, I want to pivot to you to just kind of talk about how this fits into a larger pattern that we've seen with uh, the Trump administration. We know that Speaker Pelosi has uh, subpoenaed DeJoy to, that uh, DeJoy has been called to present testimony to an oversight hearing, uh, to an oversight committee next week. Um, talk to me about um, how this kind of fits into a broader pattern that we've seen with this administration in terms of the politicization of independent agencies. Sure, and, and thanks for having me, Kristen. Um, I have to confess that I did not have sabotage as the post office to win re-election on my dystopian 2020 bingo card. It may have been something that we saw coming for a long time. Uh, Walt has already mentioned that the president appeared to have some animosity towards Jeff Bezos, the owner of Amazon, and perhaps it was in the wind from that point on. But it really does seem to be something that cropped up out of left field, and yet it's consistent with the sustained attack on the rule of law that this administration has mounted almost from day one. So to, to understand what we're talking about, the post office isn't just an essential part of our lives. It's a constitutional agency of government. It's not a for-profit business, so those sorts of criticisms that it's not making uh, money are just ludicrous. It's a service like the military, fire departments, or the Fed, none of which are expected to turn a profit in our series of government. And in fact, the post office is grounded in Article 1, Section 8, Clause 7 of the Constitution. Article 1 is the provision on the powers of Congress. And in this provision, Congress is directed to establish post offices and post roads. Some of the other Section 8 duties Congress has are to uh, create a tax structure, to establish the military, to regulate commerce with foreign nations, create money for the new nation, create a court system, declare war, and so forth. In other words, the post office wasn't an afterthought. It was one of the core functions that the founding fathers viewed as an essential democratic institution in our nation. And so our president, like other executive branch and elected officials, takes an oath to uphold the Constitution. 
And that includes the take care clause, which provides that the president must take care that the laws be faithfully executed. That clause imposes a constitutional duty on the president to enforce and uphold the laws of the United States. And it goes without saying that presidents, even though they have to strive to win elections, even though they're political actors, they also have to uphold the sanctity of elections as part of their oath and their obligation. This president, however, is using the levers of executive power to subvert the rule of law and fair elections. And what we're watching happen with the post office is just part and parcel of that. So because our laws give us the right to vote, and it should be unthinkable, but unfortunately it now isn't, for a president to use his political power to damage the post office and destabilize the, the right to vote, especially during a pandemic, we're forced to confront this situation um, in the middle of a pandemic, when people shouldn't be worried about how they're going to vote safely. And it seems just an additional layer um, of horribles that while people are already struggling, while families have lost loved ones, people are being forced to engage in this calculus of whether exercising their right to vote might cost them and their loved ones their lives. Uh, as someone who's been involved in a voting case or two um, in my life and someone who spent a lot of time fighting voter suppression in my home state, I think one thing that we do have to clarify here is, is what's going on. Because over the weekend, the president's spokespeople got on TV on the weekend shows and talked about rolling back the, the picking up of post office uh, boxes, collection boxes, and, and some other things. And I'm sure that we all can form a conclusion about whether they'll actually do that and, and to what extent. But the point here is that the damage is done. This narrative that people can't rely on the post office to deliver their ballots, that's the epitome of voter suppression. And in my career, when I've combated suppression, it's come from places, it's even come from official places. It has never come from the Oval Office. And that I think is, is something that we shouldn't gloss over. So often we're inclined to just look at this mounting list of horribles that this administration has visited upon the country and shrug our shoulders and say, well, it's Trump, there's nothing to be done. What we're seeing here is there is something that can be done. And the right to vote is so fundamental that we must do something here. Who you choose to vote for, that's a political decision that each of us is entitled to make. But exercising our vote and the right to exercise our vote, that's not political. People shouldn't get to vote if they're white, but not if they're black. People shouldn't get to vote if they're Republican, but not if they're Democrat. The right to vote is guaranteed to all of us. And that I think is what makes this so very difficult to understand. But this is a president who's had no compunction about violating the rule of law to win elections. That doesn't matter whether it's accepting Moscow's help in 2016, withholding security aid to Ukraine to try to get fake dirt on an opponent. This is, and we must understand it as, as part of a pattern of violating the rule of law. So the damage being done to the post office, narratives that suppress and confuse voters, this is all part of a mindset that actually fundamentally rejects the rule of law. Um, and it's ultimately the rule of law that makes this country great. I think it's something we didn't talk about at all before the 2016 election. I don't know that most people really considered it to be the crown jewel of our system of government. But now that we, we've seen it in play, we know that the rule of law, this notion that we have laws that are clear, that are fair, that are forthright, that are applied equally to everyone, we know we don't have a perfect system, right? We've seen that on, on full force in, in recent weeks, but we aspire to have a system that applies equally to everyone and certainly to a president who should not be above the law. That's, that's the problem that we're having. A man who's using his power to hold himself above the law to try to cheat, to win. And what we learn is that the rule of law is all that separates us from being a banana republic. It's, it's all that keeps us from being Belarus. So I'll stop there and just say that I'm glad we're here to explore these issues and to keep insisting that this administration uphold the laws that we're all obligated to live by. Um, I want to encourage folks who are watching uh, to go ahead and share any questions that you might have in the Q&A box. 
and there is already a common theme uh, uh, that emerges from those who, who have piped in with questions, and that's, okay, what do we do now? Uh, how do we rise up? Uh, how do we hold the Postal Service and, and DeJoy accountable? So I want to open the floor uh, for steps that folks want to articulate that we should be taking now and start with Walt, uh, who I know has uh, mobilized an action that gets underway this Saturday. That's right. Um, I think we're at the point where we should try a multi-pronged attack, uh, legal approaches in court, uh, legislative solutions in Congress, uh, but I have greater faith in the people right now than I do in all of these. And I don't think that means we shouldn't try all of these, but I think we're down to the point where the threat is so great and so imminent and so urgent to our Republic with this attack. And as people have pointed out, he doesn't actually have to hobble the post office. He has to convince people the post office has been hobbled. And as Joy pointed out that, Joyce pointed out, that is itself voter suppression. So I think we need to show up. I think we need to show up in massive numbers. A group that has the know-how to do that is moveon.org and they're scheduling an action this Saturday at 11 p.m. across the nation. Uh, the idea is to show up at post offices all over the nation at 11 uh, and make a lot of noise and make it clear as a show of force that the American people oppose this. And we're seeing brave people in Belarus right now standing up to an entrenched dictator doing the same thing, facing actual live rounds. It's bad enough that we have people having rubber bullets shot at them. They're gunning people down. There's video online of that. And yet these people show up because freedom is precious and they're tired of having a dictator. Well, if we don't want their fate to be ours, we need to stand up and protest this right now and say, as Joyce pointed out, it doesn't matter who you're voting for, it matters that you get to vote. And that's what makes us a republic. Uh, if you go to the moveon.org site, you can register and you'll get information. Uh, there's gonna be an attempt to create uh, pockets that are more centralized where larger numbers will show up. Um, and so you can get information about that online. I also think it's important, and I know people write this off as though it's not serious, but you do need to sign petitions and all of the other ways, reach out to your legislators. Um, and sure, people think, well, DeJoy's not going to quit because he gets a petition. But things like a petition, and I know Move On has one and other groups have them, um, send a message to people in power that there is significant movement. And those people in power that can be influenced include members of the media whose coverage follows public response. Um, there's a feedback loop where they will pay more attention when they know you're paying more attention. Um, so even these kinds of actions are important. It all builds momentum. And we have the example of South Korea, where the South Koreans built momentum and built momentum uh, demanding reforms, and it finally got results. In this case, we're not even trying to oust someone. We are trying to preserve our right to vote as Americans. I don't care who you're voting for. You should have the right to vote, and that is what's under attack, and that's why our republic is under attack. So I think number one thing we can do before we even do the other things is show up en masse on Saturday. Um, I'm sure others will cover some of the approaches for uh, having greater confidence in your ballots. If they don't, I'll jump in again at the end, but I wanted to really emphasize from the start, you gotta show up Saturday. And Walt, that's 11 a.m. on Saturday, right? Yes, yeah, exactly. And local time. I mean, it'll be a rolling thing across the country. They did this in uh, June 2018 when um, news of these family separations came out uh, and there was this wave of protests across the country and they actually built momentum because people were seeing the footage of what was happening in the east and by the time it reached the west the turnout was massive uh, tens of thousands in different cities around the country um, and so it's important to do our part in all parts of the country at local time at 11 a.m on saturday Again, you can go to moveon.org, or if you're following me on Twitter, I've been posting it at Walt Schaub on Twitter. Um, 
you know, I just want to emphasize that this administration is not as immune to public pressure as it thinks it is. President Trump told the world that he was going to hold the G7 summit at his own resort, which would have meant a massive government contract awarded to him by him. Uh, and it was the public outcry that actually scared Republican senators into calling Trump and asking him to back down, and he did. Uh, so we need to keep the pressure up. There is responsiveness to public pressure, and you should put the pressure on your legislators of both parties to do their job here. Yeah, and um, for those who wanted more detail, I've actually shared the link, savethepostoffice.net save the post .net, which has um, more information about the action scheduled for 11 a.m. local time this Saturday and a place where you can sign up. Um, so others, I, I'm just going to jump in and say that uh, litigation, I bet I, if I were a gambling woman, we close out the week with, with some legal challenges. Um, there are a number of organizations, including mine, that are um, looking at this very closely. It's tough. It's not every day that you have to sue, sue the United States Postal Service. It is not every day where the Postal Service is running afoul of the law and undertaking action that threatens civil rights and constitutional rights. Uh, we also know that there are a number of state attorneys general um, that have been rolling up their sleeves and looking at this very aggressively. Washington, uh, New York, uh, California. So I anticipate that we'll close out the week um, with that pressure point in place, legal action in the courts. But I also think that this is a moment where your member of Congress needs to hear from you. I can't tell you how many times I hear uh, from members of Congress who say, oh, you know, I'm not getting a lot of calls on X issue. It just doesn't seem like it's a big deal. The, the calls actually really matter because they kind of are a barometer of how intense people are feeling about these issues. So one thing that I think people should do today is call their member of Congress 202-224-3121, and there are two issues that I think. One is not just holding DeJoy accountable, but two, it's getting Congress to allocate the money that we need to have a successful election cycle. There has been a push to get Congress to allocate $3.6 billion for states to put in place the reforms that we need to have a successful election in the middle of a pandemic. That is money that can be used to put uh, postage on envelopes going out to voters. That is money that can be used for drop boxes. That is money that can be used to hire poll workers as we've seen uh, elderly poll workers dropping out in many states. There are states that are in tremendous need of resources to get this right. And a, a full demand has been put before Congress for 3.6 billion and they've recessed and failed to act. So that is one thing that we need to raise our voices about the second issue is money for the Postal Service. There is about, I believe, $10 billion that um, the House allocated for the Postal Service to keep it solvent and running. And M Mitch McConnell has failed to act. Senator McConnell has failed to act. So those are the, 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 that is equally as important as it is that we call for DeJoy for Lewis DeJoy to be held accountable. Congress also needs to do its job and put the money on the table so that we can have a successful election season. Others? Yeah, I, I just wanna pick up on, on both those points um, and emphasize to everyone who's listening uh, and viewing this, please access your network. You, you'd be surprised how far your own reach can go um, it's, you know, it's one thing to have someone like Walter. Walter got me yesterday. He put his piece up on the internet, on, on Twitter, and I saw it and I said, sign my ass up. I'm there. Did. <laughs> All right? I, like in a hot second, right? I was like, let's do it. Uh, and that, so of course, generates more. But folks, you have so much power. You have so much power. This government doesn't exist because a building in DC is on a plot of land or Donald Trump is sitting his behind in the Oval Office. It exists because you 
are the government. You're the ultimate final say in what happens and doesn't happen. We've ceded so much of our own authority and power as citizens to a bunch of individuals who do not have our interest any longer in mind. I know this first time, firsthand as a party official, as an elected official, I've seen it and grew very weary of it very quickly. And now trying to pay forward uh, that effort to actually engage people. So if you don't do anything, advance and access your own networks to sort of push this out. One, two, don't just call your member of Congress. Call them, yes, but call the leadership. Call McConnell's office, all right? Call McCarthy's office, all right? Call Pelosi's office. Call Hoyer's office. Call Schumer's office. Call the leadership as well. Because it's one thing when you call your Congress member, that's good, but you want to push that pressure forward as well. So make two phone calls. One is to your local member in the House and your senator, but also the House and Senate leadership to let them know. And if you're gonna be more specific, call the Republican leadership in the Senate because that's where the block is. That's where this whole thing gets gummed up. Third thing, understand what we're dealing with. Keep in mind that the president's chief of staff, right, uh, is a former member of Congress who served on the relevant committee overseeing the post office. So this idea that there's not an appreciation or understanding of how the post office works and you know the complicated, this is deliberate folks. This is not something that was made up out of hope or they just stumbled onto. This is part of a strategy, all right? When, when your chief of staff ran the, oversaw the committee that oversaw the functions of the postal service when he was in the house, tells you everything you need to know. So understand the battlefield that we're on here and appreciate that all these folks are running around playing stupid, like, oh my God, I just didn't realize and I didn't know that this worked this way. They're loading you up with crap right now. Clear out the crap. Don't let it get in your way because the reality of it is if you're not protesting now and pushing this agenda now, trust me, it becomes 10 times harder after the election is over. When Trump has already sowed the narrative effectively that this was a rigged game from the beginning and that the system was out to prevent him from getting reelected and we will rue the day he stands in front of the country and says, well, I'm suspending the results of the election until there's an investigation. And then what you gonna do? So take this moment seriously, what Walter's putting out here, what, what Kristen is putting out here, what the smart folks are saying is one thing, but don't lose sight of your own power in this fight and the struggle for our democracy. Can, can I pick up a little bit on what Michael was saying, because I think this is tremendously important. This post office piece is actually part of Trump's effort to delegitimize the outcome of the election if he loses, right? We understand this as part of his effort to say, if there are delays because of delivery, then that's, that's because fraud is happening and the election is being stolen from me. The most important thing that we can do, and this is why it's, it matters to reach into your, your networks, is to vaccinate people against this ridiculous story that the president is concocting. People have voted by mail successfully for so long. In fact, the United States military and their families deployed overseas vote by mail. There are no problems. This is just Trump trying to manufacture excuses for his ultimate loss should he lose. We've got to make sure people understand that. As Michael says, it'll be much more difficult to tell this story after the election than it is to vaccinate people against it right now. And so Walt talks about the importance of pressure and how pressure can succeed even against this administration. And you know, there's someone who should be really vulnerable to that pressure, maybe not just someone, maybe an entire group of vulnerable people. Because the federal statute of limitations for prosecuting crimes is five years from the last act in a crime. So if there's a conspiracy, the last effort to cover it up. I don't have any idea sitting here if any of what's going on is criminal. That would require someone down the road to look at all of the evidence 
and make a decision about whether or not there's a specific statute that's been violated and whether that could be proven beyond a reasonable doubt. So I'm not prejudging that, but there are some real red flags here that look like there might be a problem. And if I was Louis DeJoy, I'd get a lawyer because he's right at the center of all of those issues. If there is enough public pressure, people who are involved in this, who know the truth, might feel like they need to get ahead of it. We might actually see people either backing down, resigning, or better yet, coming forward and telling the story. And so I guess the last thing I'll say is, yes, public protest is important. Private protest is also important. And so if you're a postal employee or other government worker who sees wrongdoing, you do have a lawful path for coming forward through your inspector general or other whistleblower provisions, and your country needs you. Um, so I think that this is going to take a sustained effort on all of our parts. And let me and let me add on that. I, I love that you you ended with that, Joyce, on the on the postal worker piece. Because what I want to also add here is that the postal service, just like election administration, both are public services mandated by law, and they never get the attention. Up to this point, they've never gotten the attention, the funding, the the support generally like other things have and you know one of the other things i think that 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 everyone on this call can really do is also look to their local election officials check in with them see what they need because i, I just i've talked to six different local and state officials this morning and they are doing everything they can they're on the front lines just like the postal workers are trying to serve every single customer in the middle of a pandemic and they've been doing it and and frankly with one hand tied behind their backs sometimes too because of poor policies because of policymakers not listening to them not adjusting timelines not taking the guidance that election officials that have actually run elections and, and i know and i'm one of the you know one of them on the on the call here today uh, that ran elections for 13 years like i i'm like a surgeon when it comes to election administration and local officials state officials we we have never gotten the attention on the process on the flaws in the process on the lack of funding on all like there are so many issues that policymakers could solve and yet they haven't and that could be a lack of interest maybe they don't want to see change because they got elected in a system that currently exists whatever it might be they often are not listened to and i feel like the postal workers are also facing the same kind of thing where their their jobs have sort of almost been taken for granted we kind of take for granted what an actual election system looks like what it actually takes to be a poll worker and work 16 hours in a day, or what it means to be a poll worker, a postal worker, still out delivering the mail when everyone else is confined to their homes. Uh, so there's, there's really something here too that I think we should do whatever we can to boost those voices, boost the voices of local election officials, of state officials that are on the front lines trying to do whatever they can with the limited tools that they have, by the way, because elections have never been funded appropriately. And so in a pandemic, it, it's even worse, along with the letter carriers and the postal workers across the country that are serving the public every single day. Uh, we all know them, we all know them, they're in our circles. Uh, even thanking a postal worker when you see them come by your house today. Um, all of those things I think we should be also doing in addition to putting public pressure on uh, on Congress and policymakers, we also need to be looking to those individuals and boosting their voices because they're not celebrities. They don't have millions of people following them on Twitter and on Instagram and all of that, but they are the guardians of democracy and they are the guardians of the public services that uh, they all administer regardless. You know, there's many that are Republicans, many that are Democrats, and many like me, I was, I'm unaffiliated and was when I ran elections, but it, it, crosses the political spectrum, they all say similar things when you actually talk to them. We need more funding. We, we, the, it'd be great if this law changed so that I had more time to process ballots. All of these things, and yet their voices are often ignored. And so I think whatever we can do to boost their voices uh, as a community of advocates and advocacy organizations, celebrities, we should be boosting those voices that deal with this on a daily basis because 
that's who serves the voters and serves the public uh, every single day. Yeah. And you know, there's a there's another pressure point, and that's the Board of Governors, the U.S. Postal Service Board of Governors, which I mentioned earlier. Uh, six men, no diversity, no racial or gender diversity on the Board of Governors, but DeJoy serves, quote, serves at the pleasure of the Board of Governors. So that is another important pressure point, and I see that Betty has shared the link uh, to the leadership of the U.S. Postal Service. Um, contact them. We will actually work to share their contact information. It actually circulated uh, online, but uh, another important pressure point, a constituency who, um, you know, should hear our voices. If you are not pleased with the actions of the Postmaster General, communicate that to the Board of Governors. Um, a couple other, oh, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. I'll just say real quick on that, Michael, on that point. Michael, can you speak up? Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, a little closer to the mic if you can. Yeah, the, the, just real quick on the Board of Governors, keep in mind that those members are all Trump appointees, number one, um, that the Obama appointees were blocked during the Obama term uh, by the Senate leadership at the time. So just, just know what you're dealing with when you go into that space, who these players are and who they account themselves to. Uh, the thing I was going to suggest is that you also go to vote.org just V-O-T-E dot org. Um, and it's got some guidance there too on things you can do about your own voting and your family's voting. For one thing, you should check on whether you're registered. Even if you were registered, some jurisdictions are running around deregistering people based on any excuse they can find. So make sure you're still registered. Make sure your loved ones are still registered. Find out about early voting. Uh, if they have early in-person voting, that may have smaller crowds. If they have mail-in voting, you want to mail it early because of these things with the post office. It still should get there if you mail it early enough. So just don't wait. This is the time not to procrastinate. And uh, also, if you go in person, wear a mask. Um, but vote.org has lots of information. And we talked earlier about savethepostoffice.net. Uh, which is about the protests this Saturday at 11 uh, across the nation. And I would add to that too, um, I, and I saw some of this uh, information circulating online this weekend. Uh, not every state allows you to drop your ballot off at a polling place. Most, a lot of states, it's only the clerk's office. Uh, sometimes they have secure drop boxes, but there was sort of some misinformation that's going around. And so what I've been encouraging folks to is rely on the trusted info sources in your state. Go to the Secretary of State's website, go to the local election officials website, because that's going to have that very specific information um, by state that's available. And <clears throat> Vote.gov is, is a website managed by the EAC. It links directly to all of the state uh, election officials' websites that have then the drill down to the counties. And then canivote.org is also managed by the National Association of Secretaries of State and also links directly to those portals. So also rely on that information. That's what's going to be updated. Uh, you know, as soon as new drop boxes and that kind of thing come on. But I also don't want to see people try to drop off their ballots uh, where they shouldn't just because they're relying on bad info uh, that might be circulating that doesn't necessarily apply to every single state. What Amber is saying is so very, very important because we're not really running one nationwide election. We're running not just 50 state elections. We're running thousands of elections because elections are administered at the county level. And so there can be a lot of differences. And if you're reading someone talking on Twitter about what works for them, it might not work for you. Lots of good resources. Um, I'll put in a plug for NBC, which this morning put up an interactive map that'll take you to your Secretary of State's page. So you can see what the Secretary of State in your state is saying the rules are. But keep in mind that some of these rules are changing. They can change with rapidity either because of court decisions or as secretaries of state and governors enter emergency orders. So do your best to double check. And as Walt says, or, or Michael, I'm, I apologize, I've forgotten which of you made this point. The blue check shirt. Yeah, the blue shirt dudes. Um, check your registration status. 
Under the Motor Voter Act, we are now past that 90 day mark ahead of the election where you can't be, your status on the election rolls can't be changed. If you're an active voter today, then you should be an active voter when you go to the polls. So go online, use vote.org or something else, check your status, screenshot it, so that if you do have a problem when you go to the polls, you can then get in touch with Kristen because the lawyers committee will run a 1-800 number on the day of the election or for early voting, and you can use that to make sure your vote counts. Great. If I could, if I could real quick, um, since we're putting organizations, I happen to chair one uh, that's been around a very, very long time. You're all familiar with it, U.S. Vote Foundation. Uh, we were part of the ar original architecture of vote by mail, uh, oversee balloting, going back 20 years now. And so all of these resources are great resources for everyone. Um, you know, please take advantage of them. You know, usvotefoundation.org uh, is a portal to every state. Uh, and if you've got family and loved ones who are overseas, living overseas and want to vote, we, we do that very well. And certainly military uh, personnel who are stationed abroad, um, all of that information is there. So you've got, there's no excuse people. <laughs> You've got resources and you've got access to those resources. Again, you've got the network, tap into it, spread the word, push it out on the street. Yeah, we're, we're almost out of time, but uh, seven days out from the November, 75 days out from the November election, about 75 days out and a lot of work to do, but no doubt um, pressure on the postal service is gonna be really key to making sure that everybody is able to have their voice heard this election year. Um, I just want to close by making a few points. One of the participants you notes: know, should our advocacy, should our talking points be broader than just talking about the ballots that postal workers are delivering? And yeah, that, that's right. I mean, we're in a pandemic and we've got elderly people who are relying on the mail for medications. We have veterans who rely on the mail for special needs. We've got people in rural areas who are especially isolated right now. We've got people with disabilities um, and people with independent living dif difficulties who are really relying on the Postal Service getting it right. And so these reports that we're hearing about mail uh, taking weeks to arrive to people's homes, it's outrageous for more reasons that go beyond just this election. And um, we definitely are witnessing the weaponization of the United States Postal Service. And it's something that should have all of us um, outraged. Um, somebody asked whether we should be concerned about um, voter, voter suppression. And yeah, absolutely. Because what's happening with the Postal Service is, is that it is absolutely being weapon, not weaponized as a tool to promote widespread and rampant voter suppression. It's being weaponized to silence voters. But one other proactive thing that we can do right now is make a plan to vote this November. What's your plan gonna be? Are you somebody who wants to vote early and in person? Are you somebody who wants to wait until election day? Are you somebody who wants to vote by mail? As Joyce noted, the rules vary in all 50 states. It is one of the things that's sadly, I think, broken about our democracy, that we don't have a process that's streamlined and easy for everybody to understand across the board. States have their own prerogative when it comes to setting up rules and restrictions on voting. So now is the time to indeed make sure you're registered and to make sure that you're putting in place your game plan for how you intend to vote. And um, you can visit 866ourvote.org or call uh, the Election Protection Hotline, which we lead at the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under Law, 866-OUR-VOTE. It is nonpartisan. It doesn't matter what part of the country that you're calling from. If you're a college student who's displaced and trying to figure out how do I vote this season, if you're somebody who's never registered before, um, if you're somebody who wants to know more about drop boxes and where are they in my community, call 866-OUR-VOTE and get armed with the information that you need to make sure that you can participate um, this season. So we are out of time. I'll just open the floor for one last lightning round. Um, one sentence, one sentence. What is it going to take to get this right in November? Let's start with Walt. 
show up Saturday for the protest to save your republic. Amber. Vote. Check your registration right now. Update your address. If you want to request a, a vote by mail ballot, do that now. Do it early. Election offices are very overwhelmed with data entry, and the sooner you do it, the better. Um, and our democracy is essential. Michael. It's, it, it's, it's very simple. Just vote. You got to vote, 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 and do it now. Don't wait. Um, access early ballots uh, that are afforded to you. Uh, North Carolina, I believe, starts uh, their early uh, balloting in uh, the second week of September. Uh, early voting is already starting out there, so get yourself situated to vote as soon as you can. Joyce. Take stock of this moment. This is a just a tremendous moment in the history of our country and our experiment with this form of government. If you're ever going to go the extra mile to participate, to vote, to make sure friends and family vote, do it now. And then I'll just close by saying um, thank you to those who have been marching relentlessly uh, to end racial violence, to end police violence. And now let's add this, let's get out there and march for a stronger democracy where every voice can be heard. Thank you so much for joining us and thanks to our panelists. Thank you. Take care. Bye.